Hello everybody and welcome once again to another I've just had my hair cut and I'm looking absolutely sexy edition of Poddywood, the podcast where we talk about movies with the people that make movies. I am one of your co-hosts Steve Hester and with me as always is... Well that would be me, Andrew Roger Carson joining you this week as I do every week because well I'm co-host of the show so that would just make sense wouldn't it? It would really, you know you can't have a co-host without there being a co-host. Otherwise, you're just the host. Exactly. See, we've cleared that up. Yeah. Got there in <sighs> the end. We did get there in the end. So what news have we had over the last week? I don't know. You tell me. I'm still like, excited <laughs> about the Matrix trailer, but then again, that's just me. Been pulling that apart on the forums all over all of, over the past week and talking with the guys that used to play Matrix Online with, and just analysing every little frame. It's been wonderful. That's that's fine. I totally dropped you in it there because I know you would not have read any news over the week. Um well, basically, we had our Tommy Hinckley episode last week, which was absolutely amazing. If you've not heard it, go and listen to it. It's one of the best episodes I think we ever did. Yeah. And it's been, uh, Tommy's been sharing the hell out of it and people have been listening to it. So that's true. Uh, I'm going to take just a, a tiny moment aside. I hope you don't mind here, Steve. Uh, and, I, and it's really just to say thank you to a hell of a lot of people. Um, as most of you who listen and some of you who don't know, uh, I lost my mother on Friday and uh, it was kind of a sudden shock and I let kind of people know about it on Saturday and the outpouring of support for our family has been absolutely incredible, including from uh, our guests, Bill, Mark, Tommy, Becca, Elizabeth, Jay, all of Russell, all of them have come through sending words of support and love and I can't say thank you enough. Oh, and Steve, and Steve did it. And me as well, yeah. yeah. Hi, remember me? Hi. Only because we do this show, otherwise I wouldn't know you exist. <laughs> you don't have social media, which, to be honest, uh, I'm kind of envious of the fact that you can exist without social media because there's days when I'm like, I would just love to leave this, but then I know... Oh, it, You'd get letters, be... wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd get letters. And speaking of letters... Damn it. We need Damn to it. talk. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. We need to talk about last week's What's in the Box, which was the, I suppose, the, the part two to uh, Flags of Our Fathers' Letters from Iwo Jima. Uh, this is the Clint Eastwood World War Two story about the Battle of Iwo Jima. The original, the first one, uh, Flags of Our Fathers, was seen from the US side. This one was seen from the Japanese side. And I watched it last night. And uh, did you watch it with subtitles, Steve? I did. did you go for that really shoddy dubbed version that was done? <laughs> well, the, I, I, haven't, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yes. All I'm picturing <laughs> is just someone with a broad Mancunian accent dubbing it over. <laughs> the Sawada dub. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God, please, no. No, not him, not him again. The guy's Japanese, but we're going to dub him with a bad Japanese accent. I know. It's... No, do- don't watch any dubbed versions of movies. Watch the original versions of them with subtitles. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know why people have problems with subtitles. I have got no problem with subtitles whatsoever. But yeah, this movie, you've got as far as the Western audiences are concerned, you've only really got one name which people might recognise, and that is uh, Ken Watanabe, who yep. played uh, General... And I'm going to absolutely murder this name here. <laughs> Kuribayashi. I think that's, that's good right. enough. It's good enough. Uh, Ken Watanabe, you'll know from movies such as Batman Begins, uh, and probably mostly from Inception. I think that's been probably his yeah. biggest, uh, biggest Western film to date. But he plays the general in charge of the forces on Iwo Jima, and he decides that he's going to make things very, very difficult for the American forces by changing the tactics that they usually use so instead of using what were called banzai attacks which were just basically suicide runs towards the yes. enemy he decides that he's going to dig in he's going to f- make the americans pay for every single feat that they take on the island and it works and in reality it dragged out what should have been a five to six day campaign to well over a month now ultimately as you find out in the end of this movie the japanese forces were pretty much decimated because of yeah uh, lack of support from the mainland as well as a uh, a loss in a battle that uh, wiped out a lot of their a lot of their, their forces fleet, at yeah. sea 
In terms of the performances, I thought this movie was very well done. I thought, just as it was with The Flags of Our Fathers, in terms of which movie I prefer, I think I prefer this one. The editing is more Agreed. linear. Uh, yes, it's got editing. A, yeah, it's got great editing. It's got a few flashbacks, but you're more able to tell that they're flashbacks as opposed to the editing style that was taken with Flags of Our Fathers where you were kind of in one place and then you were at the same place a little bit further along, then you were somewhere else further back and then you were kind of unsure as to where you actually were during the battle in a lot of this. One thing that I did really like between the two films is Mm -hmm. that you never really see the opposing force in each movie. When you watch Flags of Our Fathers, which I do suggest that you do actually, because watching the two of them together was uh, was very very interesting experience. You see very little of the Japanese forces. There's the occasional one that pops out of a foxhole. Uh, most of the time, you just see their guns going off and things like that. With this, it's the exact opposite way around. So you see very little to hardly any of the U.S. forces that were taking the island. Everything's from the Japanese perspective. And there's a few moments which did kind of make me laugh, but not for the right reasons. Because the colour grading on this is shocking. How dare you? I'm sorry, it is. It might as well be a black and white movie because of how muted it all is. And there's one line where one of the the other uh, characters comes down with dysentery. And his friend says, you look pale. And I had to think, how on earth could you tell? Because the colour grading is it, it's so muted that the only time you see any kind of semblance of colour is if there's an explosion or... In right the flashback at, scenes. Or in the flashback scenes, or if there's there's like a shot of the sun towards the end of the movie, and that's it. And I get it that it was more of a stylistic choice with Flags of Our Fathers, where the battle scenes are very muted, and then when they go back to the US, that's got more colour in it. But even so, it's it got a bit much... And I was just dying for some kind of colour to the whole thing. I think the colour is used very sparingly, and I kind of appreciate mm. that because it, it provides a kind of separation uh, for the scenes, especially with the flashbacks and stuff like that. And I did my own little bit of research on this movie because I watched it again uh, last night. And one thing that was very intriguing to me, I'd say, that, that Iwo Jima is not actually taught in Japanese schools. No. So they don't actually teach about that conflict. Which is interesting. I suppose it would be the same. You don't really find out much about... Well, yeah, we're no. British, so but we don't really know much about British losses, do we? Like, you find out that a lot of school children will know about the successful attack on the Spanish Armada, but then a couple of years later, we got our asses handed to us by the Spanish. And that doesn't get taught about in schools. Yeah, they're probably not going to talk about Brexit in schools either. <laughs> no, so the th- that was the biggest loss. But, you know, though it's an American film, it was primarily shot uh, in Japanese. uh, Mm -hmm. So it did qualify for the best foreign language film at the Oscars. And the other thing about Iwo Jima is that you actually need to be granted special permission to actually go to Iwo Jima, as it is a protected island. And some of the scenes with Ken Watanabe were actually shot on Iwo Jima. They actually did get the permission to film on there, which is incredibly mm. rare. And, you know, those shots are, are very haunting. It is kind of just like this, you know, undesignated grave for the amount of people that died. Yeah, because you're looking at at least something like about 10,000 Japanese forces and, and probably, I'd say, around about equal in terms of American forces as well. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and what I'd say here, I mean, this film did considerably better than Flags of Our Fathers did because it was released a bit later mm-hmm. uh, in the same year. I am going to say the most controversial comment of all. I think this is possibly Clint Eastwood's best directed movie. I don't really think I've seen enough Clint Eastwood films to actually say one way or the other. Out of the two of them, I definitely do think it is the stronger of the two movies. I think the performances are better, the characters are more likeable. Um, and like I said, the editing is far linear and easy to easy to follow. So yeah, yeah. I'd go with that. Well, I, I love uh, the sound of this movie. is fantastic. I listened to it with headphones in and it was still amazing. Uh, cinematography is first class and it has some of the most harrowing flamethrower scenes i think i've ever seen in a movie yeah yeah well going off just on a slight tangent i do know that those flamethrowers were used during the second world war but in reality they were massively impractical i think you could only hold like about a minute's worth of fuel in the tanks and if you were hit then 
that's it. You were done. People that carried the flamethrowers had a very, very short life expectancy because one stray bullet would just wipe them out and anybody that was standing close to them in a heartbeat. Ah, it's very true. And I, and this movie was kind of a um, <clears throat> commemoration of, of both the American and uh, Japanese forces. You know, it's kind of there to celebrate the anniversary of the conflict. And speaking of anniversaries, Steve... Yeah, I'll give you that one. We watch them again all of the time Or we get them on Prime for free But we only know how old they are When we learn their anniversary Gold! There's gold in them there hills! <laughs> this gets shocking every week. Jesus Christ. I'm just going to get him to change this theme tune just so I don't hear any more of these. Oh, anyway. you love them. Yes, yes, don't I just. Okay, uh, let's start at 40 years this week. 40 years ago this week, a movie that Steve has not seen and probably never even heard of. A movie called Continental Divide was released, which was directed by Michael Apted, who people may know as directing Enigma or that James Bond movie, The World Is Not Enough. You're right, I haven't heard of it. Well, this uh, starred John Belushi, and I believe it was his greatest role. He played a uh, Chicago journalist by the name of Ernie Suchek, and he goes off onto like this kind of nature trail to do this writing on a woman who is kind of raising eagles up in the mountains. And it's a, it's a comedy slash romance, and it's just a, a brilliantly made movie and um, not a lot of people actually remember it and they should check it out if they can find it i mean it's john belushi's greatest role because i believe because he was actually clean and off the drugs and alcohol and that throughout the filming of it and unfortunately as soon as he went back uh, finished that movie and went to do another movie called neighbors uh everyone was just off doing cocaine and everything again and he regressed and then unfortunately you know he died so this was actually lawrence kasdan's first ever screenplay Oh, right. Yes, that had four studios fighting over it at the time. Oh, well, hush my mouth. And it is definitely a movie that is worth checking out, hunting down wherever you can find it, wherever it is streaming. It is a beautiful, uh, really funny movie. And as I say, it's uh, John Belushi's best. Would you say that I look like John Belushi, only with better hair? Depends which picture I'm putting on. Probably Animal House. (laughs) Probably Animal House, yes. Can you believe, Steve... And what, Andrew? 25 years ago this week, John Carpenter's Escape from L.A. was released. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, I will go on record as saying I'm a massive fan of Escape from New York. I think it's great. Kurt Russell, Snake Bliskin, love it. Absolutely love it. I know he's channeling Clint, but my God, he channels him well. Uh, when I heard that there was a sequel, I was like, okay, yeah, let's give it a go. And then I realized it is the exact same movie, except they have to surf through L.A. on a very <laughs> unconvincing green screen. Well, I will say that the CGI was absolutely terrible in this movie. And that was because of the people who were put in charge of them had never actually done CGI before. Oh, okay. So I want to know somewhere down the line how they scored that job. You know, that that's quite impressive. But Snake Plissken is Kurt Russell's personal favourite ever role, uh, which is why he returned to it. This is the only ever time John Carpenter has directed a sequel. Who did Halloween 2? It wasn't him. He he was a writer on it, and I think maybe a producer on it, right, but he okay. did not direct it. But yes, uh, I was thinking about this movie uh, quite a bit because it's impressive. Uh, I, I've really got a bit of love for this movie. One, because the entire movie is shot at night. There is no daytime in this movie whatsoever. It is just dark all the way through. That's the same with the first one as well, isn't it? Did the first one have any daytime scenes? I don't think it did. I think the whole thing takes place at night. I don't think I've seen it in a long while. I'll have to watch it again. If we're wrong, do write in and tell us. Yes. But um, I was watching the scene where Kurt Russell and Bruce Campbell were in the same scene. Obviously, Bruce Campbell plays the... uh, Surgeon General of Beverly Hills or something like that. And as I'm watching them do these this scene together, I'm wondering where their stunt double is. Because Kurt Russell and Bruce Campbell have the same stunt double. 
Oh, that is brilliant. So I was wondering when they're doing the over the shoulder shots, it's like, I wonder if this guy's standing in between both of them for each of these shots. Oh, you know what they should have done? They should have worked out, you know, which, which side of the 180 line are we on here? And then just got the stunt guy to dress up, you know, like they do where you've got half a man and half a woman. Yeah. But like half as Snake Bliskin, <laughs> half as the Surgeon General. <laughs> that would have been brilliant. But a little factoid here that I found out that John Carpenter over a couple of years later did Ghosts of Mars, uh, which is a film probably a lot of you forgot that he did. But that was actually intended as the third Snake Plissken movie, Escape from Mars. Huh. Yeah. So it probably would have been the only Escape movie worse than Escape from L.A. But like I say, I've got a bit of love for it. I went to the cinemas to see it. It, I enjoy it. It's one of my guilty pleasure movies because I I love the character of Snake Plissken. No, I like the character as well. I just think could have got away without making the same film twice. Very true. Okay. Can you believe, Steve? Mm -hmm. 20 years ago this week, Artificial Intelligence was released. I have not seen it. I've Ooh. seen I've seen in the, like, box. In the, the box. end and I've heard people say that it's really really way too long and I know that uh, what's his name uh, the little kid <laughs> Haley Joel Osment Haley yeah. Joel Osment yeah um who was recently in what we do in the shadows he doesn't blink throughout the whole film does he No then that was to give a real um kind of robotic edge to his character yeah. This was directed by Steven Spielberg and Stanley Kubrick worked on this movie for decades and people say, oh, you can tell that Stanley Kubrick really dark influence. But surprisingly enough, the darker stuff was actually done by Steven Spielberg. Stanley Kubrick actually wrote the first 40 minutes of the film. Hmm. You know, it's very lighthearted and family oriented. And I found that a real kind of contrast. And the thing that always sticks out to me is uh, the industrial metal band Ministry are in it. <laughs> right? Um, playing themselves at this like flesh fair and, you know, just belting out this industrial rock. And I was like... Wow, what an incredibly weird choice. And then I discovered, much to my amazement, Stanley Kubrick was actually a fan of them. And that would never have occurred to me in a million years that the industrial metal band ministry was high on uh, Stanley Kubrick's Spotify list in the day. Yeah, fair enough. That just goes to prove you take it all sorts, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. Well, finally, 15 years ago this week, Alfonso Cuaron's Children of Men was released. Ah, uh, yeah, again, I haven't seen it. Sorry. Yeah, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Why do you think we do what's in the box? I, I know. It, it just That's the whole purpose for that me. existing, is for you to make me watch all these films which I haven't already seen. Well, it is an absolutely amazing film. It is in the box. Alfonso Cuaron uh, also directed movies like Gravity, uh, Roma, and, uh, of course, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Asboban. I have seen two of those. There you go. I take it you've seen Gravity. I've seen Gravity, yes. Yeah, I didn't think you would have seen Roma. It's a great, no. great movie, though. I saw it on US TV where it was interrupted every 10 seconds for a commercial. Oh, oh, God, that's horrible. I'm falling down to earth. Oh, my God, everything's... Have you got car insurance? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. God. Yeah, this is, I knew there's a reason why I never watch movies on TV. But yeah, Children of Men, it's got this great voyeuristic approach. It's A lot of people just say it's like a movie with kind of no end. But realistically, I kind of see the end as a beginning. And you'll understand when you do actually see it. I will say that it has got the greatest performance by John Lennon in a movie. That is actually played by Michael Caine. <laughs> Oh, yes, I've seen it. He's got, like, long hair and, like, a grey beard and something, hasn't he? Oh, yeah, it, it's John Lennon all the way. That is obviously... He plays this um, newspaper satirical cartoonist, and uh, it's, it's very John Lennon. And I'm sure that won't be the only time the Beatles are mentioned today. But that is our anniversaries for this week. With peace and love. Yes, and everything in between. So I guess we've got to bring in our guest... Okay, so what do you get when you cross Star Wars, Alien, and Marvel? Well, one thing you get is pretty much everything Disney stole from the skip at the back of 20th Century Fox, but you also get an actor who may be the only person to tie all three of these franchises together. This week, I called on a good friend, an English thespian, writer, musician, purveyor of rare herbs and prescribed chemicals. He is a man with more roles than Greg's. Decades of TV work from early days of The Bill, a touch of Frost, Frost, <laughs> there's my Sean Connery, I'll start again. 
Decades of TV work from the bill to a touch of frost. Don't make me laugh. Ivanhoe to Life on Mars and many others. But many of us know him from iconic roles in the movies such as Dave in The Crying Game, Ronnie Biggs in Buster, Aaron in Alien 3, Rick Alley in Star Wars The Phantom Menace, comic villain Dr. Faustus in Marvel's Agent Carter, and of course, with no one eyes, Danny the Drug Dealer, and his spiritual reincarnation, Del Preston, in Wayne's World 2. He's won the Samuel Beckett Award for his play Sanctuary, and the Raindance and Sapporo Film Festival Award for his screenplay New Year's Day. He loves his music, also fronting Brighton's finest Beach Boys tribute band, the Brighton Beach Boys. He's a British legend. He's worked with Steven Spielberg, David Fincher, George Lucas, Neil Jordan, Paul Schrader, Richard Curtis and Ang Lee, among many others, with every single role bringing something completely different. How do we cover everything? Well, we don't. But we find a hell of a lot of great stuff whilst we dip in and out of the career of this incredible actor. Joining us from Brooklyn this morning is Ralph Brown. Good morning, Ralph. Good morning. Good morning. What a pleasure it is. And uh, good afternoon for you guys, but good morning for me because, of course, we are five hours apart. Yes, it's just turned three o'clock over here. <laughs> yes, we're, we're experiencing the school rush. <laughs> Whereas I'm in the unusual position of making words talking at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's almost like <laughs> being at work. <laughs> <laughs> if this is the hardest character you've had to play, that's going to be something. <laughs> There's nothing harder than playing yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, researching you is actually hard enough, Ralph, as there's so much history to cover. Now, if my research is right with me this morning, uh, you discovered your love of acting in high school and through a summer drama camp up in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So I guess we start off, what's the kind of lightning moment for you? Was it a specific performance that latched you onto this profession? Uh, I did some plays at school. Um, I'm just actually looking at, at one of them at the moment and trying to get in contact with everyone that was involved with it because uh, I'm sort of writing a sort of autobiography. And uh, this play was <clears throat> 1973. It was called A Murder Has Been Arranged. And it was the first time that I was on stage, uh, apart from the Nativity play when I was 10, when I played Joseph. So I should give that a mention, I suppose. But um yeah, so I did this school play and my, my, both of my parents came to see it. The first time they'd seen each other for six years. And um, so that was the spark, I think. I then did another one and I did another one. And then when I got to college, I was studying law at LSE because I was going to be a lawyer. So these uh, productions of school plays had not sort of turned my head in any way. They were just, they were a bit like playing football. You know, I played football for the school. I never thought I was going to be a footballer. Um, I used to play pool in the local pubs, I never used to think I would grow up and be a professional pool player. And I never once thought of myself as uh, going to become an actor. It just wasn't in my sphere of imagination. You know, never even thought of it for a second. So the moment when I did actually think of it, I suppose, would be the turning point. You know, the St. Paul on the road to Damascus was when I went up to the Edinburgh Festival in the summer of 77, the summer of punk. And... Um, I was with a, with a company called the National Student Theatre Company and, and, and all, of the, um, all of the actors and all the technicians, even directors, stage management, etc., were all students. And I was a student and, and it was advertised and I auditioned and I got it. And so it was fun for me to go up to Edinburgh with a bunch of kids rather than um, try and survive in London because my place where I lived didn't offer me accommodation, you know, through the school holiday. Uh, college holidays and I didn't want to go back home so this was kind of perfect um, I was playing an American one day after the show I was downstairs under the stage taking a leak and uh, there's a gentleman next to me who went hey well good work son where about you from in America and I was like pow I can do this I hasten to add I was playing an American <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> um, and, and um, I think I probably told this to a bunch of the people I was working with and they were like oh yeah great 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 they were saying, so what, so what are you doing? What are you doing at studying law? What's going on there? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to be a lawyer. What, what about you? And they were like, I'm going to be an actor. Well, so am I. I'm going to be an actor. They're all like, I'm going to be, we're going to be actors. And I was like, wow, you can be an actor. And at that point, I knew that's what was going to happen. So I'm quite a simple person in that respect. You know, uh, somebody has to really spell it out for me before I actually see it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think the uh, the Edinburgh Festival is probably a rite of passage for any actor, really. Yeah, went back there four times after that, so that became a sort of a summer uh, experience every every year, and um, it was, you know made a lot of links there and people that I've worked with since, and so on and so forth. And, and it's it's a real buzz. It really is amazing. It has changed since the late seventies. It's now become much more corporate, a lot, you know, along yeah. with everything else in the universe. Yeah. Well, your first role was with the BBC in Merry Wives of Windsor in 1982. Uh, hitting Shakespeare out the gate. That's uh, that's the way to go. Um, uh, you had a few roles here and there, and then you hit what was probably the biggest establishing point for every actor during that time, which was taking a role in the legendary TV series The Bill as PC Muswell. How was The Bill, and was this initially a long-term deal, like so many of the other cast members there? Uh, well, it was open-ended, and uh, this was, the, I think, the second series. And uh, at that point, it was an hour long each episode. They decided that they wanted to, because it was, what was it, 1983, was it, when I joined The Bill? Um, you know, we'd had the, we'd had the, uh, the riots and, uh, and stuff in, in um, Brixton and Toxteth and that in 1981. Um, and so they, they wanted to have a kind of racial storyline the, it was the police against black people in those days in yeah. the early 80s mm-hmm. in England, you know, and, and well, against black people and their allies, one of whom was me. Um, but um, so they, they hired me as, as, as a racist policeman and they hired Ronnie Cush as a, as a black policeman. And so we had sparks flying between us. And it was also just a, a way for the, for the writers to put different types of tension in there, I think. You know, I lasted one series. It was amazingly difficult work because we didn't rehearse we literally would get on set and and the camera would already be kind of pointing at you and you'd you'd sort of you know you'd know the lines and you'd just do it and then they'd they'd shoot it you know and it would be on to the next and on to the next and it was just really shooting from the hip kind of stuff uh, hadn't been done before like that it was like an experiment and um, probably the first tv show in britain anyway to be made in that way it was very much first take kind of thing was in the can and um, you had to think on your feet, you know, and you had to know it and you, and you, um, you had to trust it, you know. Uh, you had to make a pretty big mistake in order for them to uh, do another <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, but it was a brilliant kind of college of acting, uh, of screen acting for, for all of us, you know. Like you say, like all of um, my friends did it. Um, everyone, I think, has done one episode, you know. Uh, you know, unless you've got rich parents and then you can kind of wait until the right job comes along. Yeah, uh, <laughs> or, or you get just put into the CID department. <laughs> you, you know, you just get put straight into a movie. Um, so it was, a, it was a really great, it was a wonderful grounding. I actually, in the end, I got bored with getting the next script delivered and then kind of flicking through it to see my storyline and, and note, seeing that, you know, in, in one episode it would be tremendous, but then you have to take your turn and everyone else gets a turn and, so a lot of the time you're just sort of not doing anything particularly interesting, or maybe it is interesting, but it's only for two days out of fourteen. You know, it's it's a it's it's a lovely life because you're getting paid, and you're on telly, and everyone's recognising you. I didn't I didn't take too much to kindly to that either. And um, I remember going into a local shop in in Archway and looking for a carpet for my flat. Because suddenly I could afford a carpet, you know, and. Um, <laughs> The woman in there was trying to sell me something or other, and she went, oh, it's him, it's him, isn't he cute, isn't he cute? And she was, she was eating chips, and she started pushing them into my mouth. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, it was like that was crossing a line, and I suddenly kind of felt really exposed and vulnerable, and I didn't really want to be one of those people. Yeah, it's kind of similar to a story that Tommy was saying last week where he was explaining about the kind of loss of innocence when he we got into it. And suddenly it was a job. Yeah, and suddenly it was a job. But obviously, the more successful you get, the more recognised you get, the more harder it is to just go and buy a carpet. That's why I'm still unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... A, it's a, it, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly a deal with the devil because everybody wants to be successful, but you have to... You have to make some deal with yourself about that public side of it, you know, how you're going to handle that and what kind of person you're going to be. I think some people can handle it really well. Will Smith springs to mind, you know, but some people like me can't. And I I think I realized that quite early on. And um, I, I, I didn't think it would be a good thing for me. It goes hand in hand with having choice as well, like because if you're recognised, you're going to get more choice of role, probably, probably, yeah. or you might get stuck in one. 
it's very easy to make blanket statements about acting and what happens, but actually there's always the exception. So I decided to leave the show at the end of the first, at the end of that second series. As I said, I didn't want to do any more of them. I'd rather go and take my chances with unemployment and auditions, you know, so that's what I did. Well, to be honest, it, it was uh, a pretty substantial move because not long after the bill roll, you were kind of catapulted into the hearts and lungs of students throughout the land when you take the role of Danny the drug dealer in, I guess, now the essential and legendary cult movie, Widnall and I. Now, rumour has it, your unique audition for this role kind of secured the gig. So the question is, how unique was that audition? Well, you're asking the wrong person there, Andrew, because <laughs> I mine was the only audition I saw, I should say. I didn't see anyone yeah. else's. I think the reason why I was called in for that role uh, was because they'd seen everyone else and none of them were right. I'd done uh, some theatre in, in, in around those years and uh, the, the casting director, Mary Selway, had seen me in a, in a play playing six different characters, a, a joint stock play called Deadlines, which was about journalists. And um, I played the Sheffield, a, a striking miner, and I played Robert Maxwell, and I played a, a Newsnight reporter and all of these things, which is a kind of typical theatre kind of uh, thing in those days. And you, and you did different accents and different types of engines. And so <clears throat> because they'd run out of people who they thought were Danny, whoever they were, they started auditioning people who could act because they realised they were going to have to get somebody who was going to become this character that Bruce had written. So that was why I got in the door. So I kind of worked out how to do it when I was at home before I went in, um, just through rep repetition of the lines. I kind of dressed like a gypsy. There's a fantastic stage direction in the script, which gave me a massive amount of clues as to what I should have a look at looking like. You know, it was like Keith, Keith Richards-y, um, Sort of, sort of a rock and roll look, I would say. I put nail varnish on, black nail varnish. I probably had mascara on, and and like a you know waistcoat and a scarf around my neck and cowboy boots and all kinds of bangles up my arms and stuff. It's a it's a sort of classic rock and roll look, really. It always helps to look like the character you're auditioning for, rather than assume that anyone has got any imagination whatsoever. <laughs> this is true. Very true. Yeah, um, and I still do that, even now. Uh, and I'm 64 years old. I still find the shirt that's best for the role. <laughs> Why would you not? <laughs> you know, I I envision you have this entire wardrobe of like every kind of dress up you can get. You'd be like a uh, Mr. Ben. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, ask my wife about her wardrobe. You know. Uh, which <laughs> uh, she's also an actor, I should add. She dwarfs mine. Uh, she literally can dress up as uh, sort of like March 1971. You know what I mean? She goes, oh, yeah, that's that one. <laughs> you know? Wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's how it works. You don't throw you don't throw a piece of clothing out because unless you're going to get a get a gig like the Bill and stick with it for the rest of your life, you're going to be auditioning forever. Even if you're well known and successful, you're still going to be auditioning. That's just how it is. I mean, I have been offered a handful of roles, but I'm still I still have to audition. And so does Barbara Streisand. You know what I mean? It's like it's just how it is. Well, Danny is a true cinematic phenomenon in that he appears only twice in the entire film, but has many of the quotable lines. Uh, from the entire thing uh the voice has now become iconic right up there with arnold schwarzenegger peter laurie um that monster who was once president as the voice that seemingly <laughs> everyone can do and not get right at the same time i mean i've i've done it for andy and i'm not going to do it here because i don't want to embarrass mm. myself um <laughs> but how was this developed uh was it based on someone in particular or did it just kind of spring up naturally it, it, it was uh, the kind of attitude was based on people in in um, lewis where i um went to school in east sussex you know people who smoked weed and, and and drank cider and kind of had long hair and things and um they were a bit older than me and they were all kind of groovy you know what i mean and kind of people who kind of nodded when they spoke you know because it was like yeah man and it was like, you know so the voice already was kind of pretty first gear you know that nobody was ever going to talk fast or get too energetic it was always back there and then that worked to get me the role and then Bruce was like why don't you try doing that funny R what they call the rhotic R so my name would be Ralph Brown uh, in the voice and um, and I 
and it just sounded so fantastic and it made uh, Paul and Richard giggle uncontrollably wetting themselves in rehearsals uh, we knew we had a we knew we had a winner <laughs> we knew we had a chicken dinner <laughs> do you find yourself uh, when you are like walking down the street do people still do Danny impressions to you shouting at you it's never happened it's never, never happened. happened never happened people are too scared they 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 might do it um, in in a pub or something like that or in a party yeah or, or in a you know like a convention when you're doing a bunch of autographs uh, a sit down thing um, but no I think people are quite frightened about uh, trying to mim mimic that voice for some reason they probably do it in their own like you say in their own lives but they don't do it for my approval yeah. I think that's very wise of them <laughs> yeah. Well, it's because no one can get it right. No, and that's so. So therefore, let me do it. Um, <laughs> no, I mean seriously, have a go, enjoy it. You know, that's what it's for. I mean, if you're doing a funny voice, the first thing you want to do is do it yourself, and amuse all your friends with it. And, and especially if you're stoned, you know. So you know, I'm thrilled to bits that 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 I apparently I have contributed in that way to uh, people's lives. You know, oh, yeah. oh, definitely. Uh, there was also uh, another thing from Widnall and I that has become kind of iconic as well and there is a rumor circulating around that the infamous camberwell carrot had to be rolled by a member of the crew who was an ex-hippie as no one knew how to build a joint that size <laughs> have you heard that yeah i can't really confirm or deny that and now that i'm here and with you guys i should tell you the name of the guy that used to roll the joint he, he worked in the props department and therefore that actually was his job but he could not um, to roll the joint, I could I could certainly roll uh, a joint of that size, and that's one of the things I learned to do when I was a teenager, being being taught by these same ne'er do wells uh, in Lewis. Uh, there was one one guy who, who, for some reason, spent a lot of his time hanging around with people of my age. I mean, he was probably three or four years older, and one night we rolled a joint with him, me and my mates. Like there was a, probably six or seven of us getting stoned we would have been 14 15 something like that and he we rolled this two foot long joint which was quite tricky because we didn't really have anything that was that long but we had to glue all the papers together do you know what i mean and um and then we had to kind of you know put a, wait put with actual and, glue no with because <laughs> <laughs> you get high no, off the fumes like, Jesus. yeah it was it was like it was like a sort of technical triumph and um <laughs> So I, I was in the spirit of the Campbell carrot. I was entirely sympathetic, uh, but I didn't make it. Um, so I'm just looking at IMDb now in, in case uh, the props guy is in there. Hmm, I think it's Steve Payne. Props standby. There you go. Steve Payne, if you're still with us, uh, you can come round to my house. It's fine. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I've got a birthday coming up. Teach me your magic. Uh <laughs> I'm saying nothing. Um, why do you feel that this film has kind of outlasted a lot of its contemporaries as this cult phenomenon? What is the, its magical appeal in your eyes? Yeah, no, we've talked about this a lot, um, the, the people who made it, and, and, and we've, we've wondered that as well. And obviously there's been anniversary celebrations on, on Radio 4 or little documentary movies and stuff, and it's, you know, it's, had, it's had a fair bit of attention and we've all had a chance to think about that question. Um, my answer I used to give was there are no shit bits in it. <laughs> Very true. You know, like really simple. Really simple. It's every scene, every moment in every scene is truthful and good. You know, it's it's a brilliant script. But it's also there's something intangible about it because it seems to be about something. But I think it's actually about something else. And you can argue about it for you know. Uh, I said to Bruce like, you know, decades ago, you've written a gay film, Bruce. You know, and he went, no, I think well, I haven't. And I was like, well, have a think about it. You know, there's, there's all of the women in it are kind of, you know, crones or, you know, the woman who eats the fried egg sandwich at the beginning. And and then there's Jeff Wode, you know, and imagine the size of his balls and his Uncle Monty. And I was like, come on, Bruce, he's absolutely lathered in, uh, in, in the homosexual. And he was like, he was like, no, it is. He just absolutely refused to listen to that. But that's a legitimate, you know, interpretation of what's going on there between with male and I, and uh, you know that one of them is gay and one of them isn't. And I think that's interesting. Um, it's incredibly funny. It, it's about a, it's about things that you can't say. It's about a friendship and how close two guys can get as friends or not. You know what I mean? And 
Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, it's true. I mean, it's, you know, I, Paul McGann, is Bruce, and it's based on his, he was an actor, and it's based on his experiences. And, um, yeah, he's just a genius. That's why it's a good film. It's true, and, and as years kind of get on, it just gets better and better. It's one of those films that every viewing... I mean, there's sites on like Facebook and things like that that are dedicated to Widnall and I, where people have to basically comment using quotes from the movie, um, the movie alone. Mm. And I've never seen anything like it to kind of have that kind of following. But apparently the test screening was initially thought to be a disaster. Uh, it was met with total silence during like all the funny bits. Uh, and there was a reason for that. But were you there? Can you tell us actually what happened? Do you know what? No, I, I can't uh, answer that because I wasn't there. I, the first time I saw it, I, there was a very strong reactions from Richard and, and also from, I have to say, from me. I, I thought I was talking way too slowly. I mean, it's like the film grinds to a halt as soon as, soon as Danny appears on the screen. And I just couldn't deal with it. And I was sitting next to Richard Griffiths in the, in the screening and, and I went, Hell, I'm talking too bloody slowly. And he went, nonsense, dear boy. Marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> and went, Still in oh, character. Well, and Richard um, uh, went outside and, and vomited and has never watched himself on screen since. No oh. rumour has it, which I understand. But uh, no, the, a, a, a test screening in front of an audience of, of humans, uh, I wasn't aware that that actually happened. So do, do enlighten me. Okay, well, apparently um, Bruce Robinson has, has said this story somewhere. I'm not sure if it was in maybe his autobiography or something. I'm using it off stuff I've researched on the internet. The test screening that they did show, no one was laughing. So the place was absolutely full of people. No one was laughing at the funny bits. They thought, oh, my God, you know, it's an absolute dud. Apparently the real reason for what it was, they had pulled in a hotel full of Germans <laughs> who came in to actually watch the movie. <laughs> And didn't they were not understanding it at all. But they found um, out later on that they'd sourced all the people to come and see the movie from this hotel, and it was a whole bunch of German people in town for something. Uh, so, uh, was ist das Scheiße? Yeah, yeah, das ist nicht so hässlich. Um, yeah. I need to hear the German version of this movie. Yeah, und warum nicht? <laughs> um, they, that's kind of classically uh, slick British film industry work there. Um, but also, what I like is it's in the spirit of the film oh yeah that that would happen i made the mistake of watching it again i must have watched it 10 times now and, and paul and i went to bristol to do a, a screening maybe 15 years ago i can't even remember now but anyway there we were and um phil jupiters was then interviewing both of us on the stage afterwards so we didn't have to watch it but we just decided we would you know um i think paul really enjoyed it and i just I just was not in the right zone. I don't know why, but you have to be in the right zone to watch something that you've made. And if you're me, you do anyway. So I'm, I'm just, yeah. it, it freaked me out completely, which it can do. And I, and I haven't seen it since. Well, following on from your role as Danny, you go on to have a huge increase in roles over the later part of the 80s and the early 90s, most notably in British hits Buster and Scandal. At the time, was the Danny character viewed as the door opener or did you think that With Nail was just a gig that would be quickly forgotten about? Yeah, it was a slow burn. It certainly wasn't a hit. Most people who saw it liked it. Um, but but it was just, it was like a little kind of secret, really. I mean, I, I was already, I mean, I'd done some other bits and pieces. So I was in the room anyway, do you know what I mean? The big one that I knew was going to, I knew was going to be a great film was The Crying Game. And mm -hmm. I... I was absolutely desperate to be in it. I read it and it was just, I just thought it was a brilliant piece of writing. And you just don't read that many brilliant pieces of writing. So I, I focused quite heavily on that. And luckily a, a producer was a friend of mine from back in the day, Steve Woolley. And um, he was keen for me to be in it. And Neil thought I was a funny guy because of With Nail. So definitely With Nail opened that door. And by then With Nail was starting to get, get a bit of steam up about early 90s. And I guess since then, it's been my ticket, you know, more than the crying game, much more. Uh, in the early, in the first ten years of, of, of the movie coming out, from like, I would say 1987 to 1997, I had, to, I had some influence, but it's it's really weird. It still it still feels like there's people who hold it really close to their heart, and 
some of those people work in the film industry. And so yeah. therefore, they're always going to look on all of us sort of kindly and or just want to add us to their collection of people that they've worked with, you know. And so like directors and producers are like that. They have these kind of collections of people. They, go, they can sort of go, well, I worked with him and her and him and, you know. And so that, that's kind of what they're doing is partly is collecting this gang of people that they whose names they can drop uh, at dinner, you know. I'm not saying that in an un unkind way. It's like it's just that's how humans, creative people work. And so, and so that's been just a lovely thing. It's been a really lovely thing. And, that, and I think that's why I've worked with so many, I mean, the people that you reeled off at the beginning of the introduction to me, I was like, wow, <laughs> you know. And um, Paul Schrader as well, by the way. And it was like that they're people that saw that film. And they just, that's all they needed to see. They didn't need to see a whole career of, of parts of doing this, that and the other. They see that part and they see that character and they're like, yeah, he's, he's, he's great. I do remember being at college around about 1997 uh, studying drama and it, it was a almost a requirement of the student body to have seen that movie. Mm. It, it should have been on the curriculum, except, you know, <laughs> I don't think yeah. this, the college uh, governing body would actually go for it. But yeah, it was so important as a student around about that time to actually see that. I mean, I think before we move on, I just have to say that the key reason why that film works as well as it does is because Bruce took control of every single element of it in a, in a way that no other director has ever done that I've worked with since. Um, in the sense that if you're an actor, one of the things that you really don't want to hear is a director coming up to you and saying, oh, by the way, this is how it goes. Does this dog get in the oven? Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, you don't want to hear somebody saying your lines because you're not saying them right. That's just the ultimate insult. True. You know, you, you, you're you saying somebody else's words, you're wearing somebody else's clothes, you know, you, somebody's doing your hair, uh, somebody's telling you where to stand, and somebody's telling you how loud to do it and putting a mic on you and poking you around. All you've got left is how you're doing it. You know, that's your that's the thing you own. So then when the director comes up to you and goes, oh, by the way, this is how you're going to be doing it. 99 times out of 100, you're like, cough. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm doing it like this. You know what I mean? You don't say my lines, and I would say that to a director. I say, don't ever say my lines at me. That's my job. You know, Note taken don't from say there. the lines how you want to hear them. That's just not how it works. You've got to be a bit more imaginative than that. You know, and a bit cleverer. Um, and you might be wrong as well. But Bruce was right. <laughs> uh, Bruce had written it, and Bruce conducted it, and and directed it. He'd give you two or three goes, and then he'd come up and he'd whisper in your ear. He goes. Ralphie, it goes like this. Does his dog get in the oven? Da, 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 da. I'm like, all right, mate, cheers. And I do it like that, and I go, he's absolutely right, you know. Um, and he must have done that to me maybe five times. And God knows how many to, to the other fellas. And I think we all kind of just loved him so much, and we loved the script so much, and we knew that he was right and that he could hear it, you know, and... We just, we just went along with it. It's, it was very, very unusual. Well, in 1991 and 92, I guess, I guess it's getting really interesting for Ralph Brown around this time, as you mentioned, The Crying Game, and you're revealed to be in the cast of the much-anticipated, at the time, third instalment of the Alien franchise. Now, this kind of production has a, has a huge troubled history as showcased in the documentary that was released on the DVD. It's a huge Hollywood production, uh, being shot in the UK. It's the first movie also to be directed by David Fincher uh, in his youth. And apparently, <laughs> funnily enough, uh, David is a huge Widnail fan as well. And Alien Free featured both yourself and Paul McGann. And apparently, uh, from what I hear, Richard E. Grant actually screen tested for the role that went to Charles Dance. So this was, in a way, David wanting to have that kind of Widnail reunion. Correct. He wanted he, he wanted some of the some of the British stardust on his Hollywood production, <laughs> uh, which was very sweet. And he he wanted Richard to play Clemens, the Doctor. And in the end, um, it was the it was Fox, I think, who just said, "You can't have three people from the same film," in the, uh, 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 something along those lines, and and kind of forced him to choose two of us, which I, I always think is really. I don't know. I mean, I remember Bruce saying to me when he was making How to Get Ahead in Advertising, which I'm not in, uh, sorry, Ralph, I, I really wanted you to play the so-and-so part, but I can't just 
cast everyone from Withnail again, can I? And I was like, Trufo? You know what I mean? It's like Woody <laughs> Allen. I mean, what? why not? Do what you like. People have a family of actors. They work with some directors. Some don't. Some, some like to collect actors. Uh, and they want, and so some just look at the script as a completely new job and they just want the person that's absolutely right for it. But some people like to work with their family. Yeah, I suppose Christopher Nolan's a good example. Yeah, and it was like, you you know, you make, you, you make a good piece of work and you have a good relationship and then you kind of, it's just disappointing when they just make a, a weird decision to not use you. <laughs> you know, like, no, I'm not using you because I've already worked with you. You know, it's like, oh, okay. Uh, that was that was you know we, I got to I got to meet meet and work with Charles Dance instead and that was and that was lovely and, and that was that's a good relationship in my life. Alien Three hosted pretty much a who's who of British acting talent. Um, you had Danny Webb, Pete Postlethwaite, Pete Davis, and of course Mr. Rottweiler himself, <laughs> Brian Glover. Um, so Ledge. Naturally, being a British actor on the theatre circuit, there must have been a sense of camaraderie between you and all the rest of the cast. I think so. Yeah, on the whole, um, there was a, there was a, there was also a sense of of uh, how come you've got such a big part because you haven't really done um, <laughs> you, you know you haven't really done enough work to justify that. Whereas you know Pete Postlethwaite and and Pete Davis and all these other guys who've been around for yonks doing really good movies and stuff. Anyway, you know there was a, there was a bit of that. But but on the whole, it was it it was really camaraderie. Do you know what I mean? It's a five month shoot. Uh, the the first Gulf War was going on. It, we were in Pinewood. It was cold, and it was a paranoid experience because maybe because it was a horror film, or maybe because Fincher w- was looking over his shoulder at the um, the producers. You know, there was this image of people looking over their shoulder. That for me, that was my image of Alien Three was was somebody looking over their left shoulder like. What's behind you? And um, I think most people were walking around the film set with that vibe. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. But it was an amazing experience. Yeah, apparently there was um, there were some days where, from what I understand and hear, you'd been rehearsing for scenes and then suddenly you'd show up to set and it had all been rewritten and restructured. So was there a lot of that going on? Yes, and, and that is there's a certain type of Hollywood film that works like that. Uh, I would come in to work. I mean, we all came into. Eventually, we all came in every single day, first thing in the morning. All went through the works, the costume, and makeup, and then we sit in your dressing room and wait and stand by until you're all required. That is not normally how filming works. Normally, it's scheduled so that we're doing scenes eight and nine tomorrow, and you're not in those, so you don't have to come in. Uh, Alien Three. We all came in every day. Then you would get these pieces of paper would come under the <laughs> under your door, which would be the rewrites. I had five different deaths in that film, including falling into the lead mould, which eventually Ripley did, of course. Spoiler alert. Uh, And, uh, (laughs) you know, um, getting that head skull punch from the alien and eventually the one that I eventually had. So, yeah, there were lots of rewrites going on. I think you were the the last person apart from uh, Sigourney Weaver to die in that movie. You'd lasted the entire way, which is not bad for someone who apparently had uh, limited intelligence in the character. He seemed to do pretty well. Yeah, the limited intelligence was another one of the other rewrites. I'd already shot two two scenes when they decided I had limited intelligence. I was like, I've already shot two scenes. And they were like, that's okay. I'm like, thanks. Now I've got to work out how to how to have a performance which is consistent with what I've already done, and yet then truthful to what you've just written. <laughs> you know, that's uh, all right. You leave it with me. I'll sort that out. <laughs> so it was uh, David kind of being the new director on the scene. You know, kind of really an experience, especially for something of that magnitude. I mean, was he very open to uh, your expanding on the character and what you brought to it? Yeah, I mean, I didn't bring that much to it apart from questions for him, to be honest. And I couldn't, whatever I did bring to it, I had to, you know, you had to be nimble because the rewrites would come in, and if you kind of settled on something, and and then they decided it was going to go another way, you might end up with egg on your face. So you have to be quite careful. And uh, people just go for the lowest common denominator in the end. I think we all ended up playing a version of ourselves, in fact, in that film. Certainly Brian, certainly Charles, me, less so Danny Webb, I would say. But yeah, Pete and uh, Clive Mantle, all these people, that, that's who they are. That's who they're like. They're sort of like, they're not, they're not putting a character on, really. Because then you know you're safe. Yeah, then you know you're going to be consistent, whatever they throw at you. David was lovely. David was just the sweetest guy. And, you know, he would confide in me and say things like, uh, 
I'm shooting long tracking shots so they can't cut into them. I was <laughs> like, who's, who's they? He's like the studio because they're going to cut it up. As soon as I deliver it, they're going to cut it up their way. I was like, really? That's a drag. He was like, yeah, it is. So he was already on that fight from day one. And so he was trying, yeah, he was trying to shoot around potential edit. Of course, you can cut into a long tracking shot, you know, you do what you fucking like. But uh, he was doing what he could um, to make it impossible to alter his cinematography. Uh, yeah, and he, that was a that was a bad experience for him, to say the least. First barbecue, fingers and arms got burnt, you know. Quite badly, yeah, because I think after that he refused to work with Fox for several years up until mm. Fight Club. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, Alien Three it needs its own episode. It's it's such a classically problematic production. But what were the main breaking points for the cast, and what were the the telltale signs that the production was in trouble? I don't think we ever thought it was in trouble. You know, we were all getting paid. It, we had a massive amount of time to make the film. They had we had four units shooting at the same time. Uh, you know, we had a, you know the the main unit. We had the the fire unit, stunt unit, and uh, and the second unit. It, it didn't feel like it was in trouble at all. And I think most of us didn't really have... It was my first Hollywood movie. We didn't have anything to compare it to, apart from little British films. So for us, it just felt like a much larger budget version of what we'd all been doing. David sort of being paranoid about the producers wanting to, to re-edit whatever he was going to make also didn't feel like a particularly unusual worry. <laughs> you know, I just thought, well, yeah, obviously, <laughs> if you're spending that much money, they probably are, and you're only... 26 or whatever he was. I, I, I had my own problems with that film, which I did take personally, but I didn't think that that meant the film was going to be crap particularly. I wasn't happy with the rewrites when they came in and I asked for a meeting with Walter Hill and David Geiler and they were like, uh, what do we have to do to talk you into these rewrites, Ralph? And uh, Walter Hill had these mirror shades on and I thought they were being quite sinister, but then I later found out that he had cataracts and he had to wear those glasses because he had a, a problem with one of his eyes. So that's, a lot of the paranoia was misplaced. But um, Sigourney Weaver certainly didn't want me to steal any of her limelight, and I think she had those rewrites done to downgrade that character. I was aware of that. So that was unpleasant, and it was, and it was something I had to deal with. You know, I had, to, I had to deal with what I had to deal with and still make sure that the performance that I gave every day was going to be good enough, was going to be of a standard. You know what I mean? That was my primary objective was, doesn't matter what happens, just make sure what goes in the can is good enough. Uh, yeah. Least, you know what I mean? And that's really, that's that becomes this kind of nightmare, really. Well, I suppose a good thing about following that troublesome production, you, you found this, uh, when we were talking the other night, you kind of mentioned that it was just this fantastic project in the crying game. And, you know, the film has become legendary, uh, but you knew ahead that this was going to be something special just when you read the script, even though it, it was pretty, it was a pretty small budget movie at the time. Yeah, budget doesn't make any difference. You know, you just, re you just read the story and, 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 if, and if it's going to be a good film, it's blindingly obvious. And, you know, if it's a small budget film, they, they can't walk around with it too much. So it'll, it'll just be what, what it is. Funny thing about that is that when we're going on set for the first day, and I think my first scene was in the pub with Jim Broadbent and um, and we all kind of sat and read the scene and somebody went off to get makeup and me and Neil Jordan just left sitting there and he went, what is it, Ralph? What's fucking wrong with this scene? It's a piece of shit. And I said, Neil, it's not. It's absolutely fantastic. He went, no, I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I was like, do not rewrite it. It is fine. You know, you have to trust what you've written. You've got a different hat on now. You wrote it. It was brilliant. I read it. We all love it. That's why we're all here. Now you've got the director hat on and you've just got to trust that guy that wrote that and shoot it and don't piss around with it and do not rewrite it and don't, you know what I mean? Leave it. I had to talk him down, man. And, uh, yeah, I don't think he did much pissing about with it, but it's, I think if you're writing it and directing it, that's, um, you've got to have quite a strong character, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful film. So proud. No, it is. So proud of it. We all went to Hollywood for the for the Oscar ceremony, you know. I think we were up for six, and we won Best Screenplay. And I held that beautiful thing in my hand that night because we were at a party, and all the nominated people came back to the party where everybody else was, and we all had a go at lifting that mighty statuette. And that was a, a highlight of my life. Yeah, they're heavier than they seem. Yes, and they do seem quite heavy. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm guessing they got covered in sticky fingerprints very, very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody had a little cloth and they kept wiping it down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just imagining uh, it's just someone coming out of the back periodically buffing it and then going back. <laughs> it's like that, it's like that person on the uh, Warner Brothers studio tour. When I, one of the times I went to Warner Brothers, they've got the kind of uh, shop area, but they've got like a little museum of all the props and stuff like that, and they have all of these Oscars in a big glass case. And there's a girl there who says, oh, would you like a picture taken with one? And they hand you something like Best Documentary from 1971 or something like that. Mm. And I got my picture with it, and I'm looking at it thinking, how many times has this been dropped? <laughs> I right. think yeah. someone must have dropped this, because she's standing there with a cloth in her hand, and every time you hand it back, she's giving it like a quick wipe before handing it to someone else. Mm-hmm. So there must be someone at the Oscars who actually does that. Oh, um, yeah, they must. They must. You must polish your bust. You, you never think you're <laughs> going to get close to it, but um, that's the closest I got. An Emmy is heavier, by the way. Yeah, it looks heavier. That's ridiculous what they were all lifting up the other day. Oh god, yeah. I had to. Um, I actually got a picture holding uh, someone's Emmy when I got to LA. That infamous time when I met you, Ralph, when my luggage went missing, mm. <laughs> and uh, uh, Mark Marshall put me up in his house, and he had an Emmy there. I was like, I really want to see how heavy this thing is. I had two hands it took to actually lift it, so I'm like, Jesus, this is really heavy. <laughs> I don't want to drop it. Yeah, Ted Lasso. God bless walked off with everything and um, I'm assuming that you guys not being football fans haven't seen it and that would be an error on your part because it's actually not about football. Oh the, the series I, I do know of it, yeah. it's just yeah. trying to find time to commit to a series these days It's is... on Apple isn't it? Apple, Apple TV yeah, Plus? Apple TV yeah. Plus. Yes. I, will, I will It's check absolutely out. me and my wife's favourite thing there's um, there, there's also before we carry on with the questions now, there's uh, there's also a, uh, a Spanish language series called uh, Club de Cuervos, um, which is which is all about football. And even though yeah, I'm not a big football fan, but that was really really funny. That's on Netflix as well. Thank you. Yeah, Ted Lasso is not about football. It's about masculinity. So now you know. Oh, there's me told. There's you told. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny. It's a, it's a comedy. You know. I know I don't make anything sound funny, but it is it is funny. You fully transferred over to Hollywood movies with the role of Del Preston in Wayne's World 2, a character that everyone classifies as Danny with a different name. So what were the subtle differences between the two characters uh, that you made in order to separate them? Drugs. (laughs) Good answer. There are none in Wayne's World 2. It's Danny goes to Hollywood, which means tattoos. Tattoos are all right. Uh, Leather waistcoats are all right. Wigs, earrings, and the voice, uh, they're all okay. Camberwell carrots, not so much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was a sort of shiny version of Danny in, in the rock and roll industry and unfeasibly without um, taking any spliff. But, yeah, it didn't seem to, didn't seem to um, spoil it, did it, really? Well, no, apparently um, Mike Myers, again, a fan of Widnall and I, and I guess that he kind of pushed for you on the production because I think right about this time Widnall and I was actually starting to get world renowned and, and introduced in the US and stuff like that. I think the closest that um, Dell actually gets to drugs is probably the cyanide pills, to be honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, they didn't tell me that. I got phoned by my agent at home in London, and uh, I always used to have this, you know, cheesy joke whenever the phone rang, I'd go, that'll be Hollywood on the line. Um, and it and it would be uh, my brother or something, and um, and this time it was, and they were like they want to they want to fly you out to to read to read this script in a, in a reading around a table. It's not an offer, but they're going to pay for the flight and they're going to give you some tea and something like yeah great. And I you know flew out, I got there, driven straight to the studio. There's the table. There's a few sandwiches. There's the script. Grab it. There's there's where I'm going to be sitting. They've already decided that, and so I just flick through it because I'm quite early, and I'm like, oh, oh, this is Danny. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. okay, the way it's written, the kind of style of the writing. You know, this may be the reason why Keith Richards cannot be killed by conventional weapons. <laughs> saying it in my normal <laughs> voice is going to sound better if I say this may be the reason why Keith Richards cannot be killed with conventional weapon. <laughs> uh, that's just going to be better. You know what I mean? So I was like, okay, so then, 
So then this isn't really an audition, is it? You know what I mean? That's my next thought. Because yeah. actually it's been written for me to do or for somebody to copy me, right? It was a funny feeling. And um, I think I said to Mike, maybe after I got offered it, which was the next day, you wrote that for me, Mike. He went, no, we wanted Robbie Coltrane to do it. <laughs> wonder what happened to him i don't know i just never i never got my head around that at all i think they were taking the piss out of me there to be honest but i'm glad they were because because i got to do it and um it was it was just it was just wonderful i was late on my first day um in, in america you have to drive yourself to work yes and um i was late i had this map i had this car i think i forgot something really critical so i had to turn around and go back home and then i was like about an hour late or some horrible hour and a half late and we were way down south central like from where i was i was up, up near sunset boulevard it took me ages to get there i didn't know where i was going never been there before and i and, and i got there so late and i was feeling obviously there's nothing worse than being late and it was my big scene the big scene in the cafe where i'm doing the story about the brown m&ms and all that stuff and i i knew that the you know, first thing in the morning they're going to line line up which means they're going to rehearse you know with all the extras and and work out where everyone's sitting and blah 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 put the cameras and then you can go into do do your makeup and stuff afterwards so i was waiting to get yanked down onto the set as soon as i arrived and they're like oh, hi ralph morning yeah uh, your trailer's here you know and i'm getting sitting in the trailer i'm like why are they sitting me in the trailer i'm two gig hours late and uh <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly somebody comes to the door and goes um yeah just like to come into makeup if they're ready they're ready for you in makeup i'm like i Bet they are, you know. And uh, <laughs> so we go into go into makeup and sit down. They're like, um, so let's just have a look. And you know, and she's kind of met, you know doing and she puts the wig on. This AD knocks at the door and says, "Ralph, can we have you on set, please, for rehearsal?" I'm like, "That'd be great." So we go down and we rehearse, and then that's all fine. And everyone's like, "Oh, morning thing." I, I, I'm like. Nobody's said anything. And then I go back to makeup and I get made up and I've got the wig now and the tattoos put on and I've got a leather jacket on. And I think maybe they don't do the tattoos, you know, all down the arms because you're not going to see them because I've got a leather jacket. on. So maybe that was how they saved a bit of time. But anyway, go on, do the speech, do it again, do it again, do it again, you know, like different sizes, different takes. Uh, and it's just basically me doing a speech. That's basically what the scene is. And it's a really long speech. It's about a page, and it's it's kind of wacky, you know, and funny. And and then finish, and that's it. And okay, that's lunch, everybody. And everyone's like, hey, well done, Ralph. Okay, you're released. You know, that's that's you done. Um, uh, Ralph, first AD. Nobody said a word. Um, we're gonna get you. A, I think we should get you a car, you know, because <laughs> you're you're a foreigner. You know, you're on the wrong side of the road. Uh, you're in a different town. Um, so we're, I think we're going to get you a car. Uh, leave it with me. Maybe we'll get, yeah, we'll think we'll get you a car and a fucking alarm clock. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Have a nice afternoon, Ralph. That was, uh, that. but he saved it until I wasn't working. And I thought that was amazing that nobody said a single thing to me because they knew I had to, Thanks, Roxy. They knew I had to <laughs> deliver this speech. You know, it's a bit like Alien Three. You still got to put the thing into the camera. You still got to, you still got to do it. And so they don't want they don't want me to have this kind of antsy, you know, apologetic. Oh, they shout. Oh, I'm. You know, they don't want me thinking about being late. They just want me to get on with the job and do the job properly, best as I can do it. And that's all I want to do as well. But they so that they kind of put their thumb on that on that bit, and then. <laughs> when I'd finished working, they let me have it. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> Being the huge music lover that you are, Ralph, uh, this is a very natural fit for you to get into a movie like this and share the screen with bands like Aerosmith, Pearl Jam, Van Halen. You've also got the famous Aussie story that Dell recites a few times in the movie, like you said. But was there a particular highlight for you over the entire production? Mm. I, I suppose I have I have a couple of things that I remember with great fondness. One of which is the scene in the nightclub where where in the in the film Mike Myers poses with a fist in front of a statue of Lenin under this nightclub in Moscow. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty pretty bold. But in between takes, uh, it was Christopher Walken, Tia Carrera, 
um, and Mike and Dana and me, Chris Fowler, yeah, who passed away quite soon after that, sadly. We would all just stand around um, shooting the breeze, trying to make each other laugh. And there wasn't any room for anyone to be the big star like Chris, Christopher Walken or... I mean, it was just, it was lovely. It was really funny, you know what I mean? And and um, Dana and, and Mike would call me upstagey. Hey, how's it going, upstagey? Uh, scene steely, how's it? Uh, you, you having a good day, scene steely? <laughs> <laughs> that was like, uh, I, I mean, it was funny, but it was also like not funny, <laughs> you know, but it was mainly funny. So... I remember that with great fondness and, and I suppose in, uh, when we were shooting Wayne stock and I had to get up every morning because I was, I was just in the waistcoat for most of those scenes. So all the tattoos had to be applied by hand mainly and so I, I would get to work at 1.30 a.m. Um, and we would do tattoos until 6 and then we'd have breakfast and then we'd put the wig on and so on and so forth. So one day I was walking from from the festival site back to my trailer and the producer, Lord Michaels, was walking the other way. And I, he said, Ralph, hey, how's it going? I was like, oh, it's great. He said, everything all right? I said, yeah, it is. He said, I said, but can I ask you a favour, though? He said, what? I said, can my name be on the poster? Because I've never had my name on the poster of a movie before. And I just, I don't know any other way of getting my name on there other than asking you. <laughs> He went, sure, absolutely, yeah. Hey, all right, have a good afternoon. And he, off he went. And I was like, is, is that going to happen or not? That's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, that was too easy. That was stupid. And, yeah, my name's on the poster, you know. And I was like, that's really sweet. I know a lot of people speak very high, highly of him. He did Saturday Night Live forever. But um, I remember Judy Birchall, uh, the, the British journalist, got so annoyed at it for some reason. She was like... How come Ralph Brown gets his name on the poster, but but uh, so and so doesn't? You know, somebody who who probably didn't want their name on the poster. I can't, I can't even remember who she. She's like she was ordering the status of the people in the film according to her version. I was like, quite, I was quite chuffed with that. Really. Well, uh, you're right in saying uh, obviously with the upstagey name, but the character did receive rave reviews. Uh, obviously drew a lot of attention to Danny. I think I actually saw Wayne's World 2 before with Null and I, mm -hmm. uh, which was quite a shot when I did eventually see with Null and I, which I think was in the mid-90s, and said, hey, that's the same guy out of Wayne's World 2. <laughs> I might be the only person ever who has said that. But um, instead of kind of fully transferring it to Hollywood, you did stick a lot to your English roots. You worked tons of UK productions for TV, stuff like uh, Ivanhoe, Touch of Frost, as Sean Connery would say, yeah, Jonathan, would. yeah, Jonathan Creek, plenty of others around the late nineties. Uh, was it just this love of UK productions that you carried on working there, or was it kind of tough to follow that Del Preston role in Hollywood? Well, yeah, the the, the latter. I think it was it was um, it's funny. I got I got the most amazing review in my life for that movie. I was hanging out with David Fincher at the time. We used to hang out for those two years, and he hadn't done any, anything since Alien Three. And I had done this, and he was jealous, and he was he was annoyed that he wasn't working, and he was he was in a funny place anyway. And he, the review was in the LA Times, and it said, you know, Ralph Brown walks away with the whole movie, kind of review. And he looked at it, and he went, congratulate, you know, did that kind of congratulations line, uh, like like Withnell does at the end of Withnell, and um, and he said, um, I hope you remember me, uh, you know, when you're picking up your Oscar, or uh, well, something along those lines. And that, you know, how interesting how that's turned out. Yeah, mm. um, but bless him, he wasn't in a great. He wasn't in a great space. He wanted me to be in Seven. Uh, I think I felt that I wasn't going to have to audition for it, and then suddenly I did have to audition, and then suddenly it was tomorrow, and then suddenly I was sitting there fluffing it. You know, he was like, "Doesn't matter." It was like he was really being sweet that I that I wouldn't have cast me based on what I did <laughs> that day. That would have been the big pickup um, gig after Wayne's World too. Didn't get that, but I was auditioning. I was doing auditioning for like three things a week that that year. I, was, I, I literally was up for everything that was made that year in Hollywood, um, from uh, things to do in Denver, When You're Dead, and The Usual Suspects, and Seven, and etc. 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 The year before that, I was offered a film called Speed, and um, my ma uh, agent was uh, negotiating that for two weeks, money, billing, uh, dates. 
and then uh, oh sorry Dennis Hopper's doing that part oh. so that was another lesson um, and, and Hollywood has, has a lot of these lessons and it was no 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 and then I, I, I thought back to that review in the LA Times I was like that's such a great review Ralph Brown walks away with the whole picture and then I was like wait a minute if I was a American actor who lived in Hollywood and had a career and I read that review I'd be like don't fucking cast that guy nobody's walking away with any of my pictures upstagey scene steely no thanks so a victim of my own success perhaps hmm. or just not good enough in the auditions really hard to work it out not what they were looking for so we moved back to England and that's why I got a lot of English work in the late 90s because that's where I lived well, in 1999, the biggest thing on the planet at the time was the impending Star Wars prequels, which in retrospect, history has been more kind to in the release of the sequels, The Last Jedi Can Do One. Um, you appeared in The Phantom Menace as Rick Olay, which sounds like an Irish Russell McKay movie. Um, release the Mulcai cut. Um, you got it, it in. Brilliant. Had to. Uh, Genius. Did you actively seek a role in this franchise, or how did you end up landing it? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, we should mention that it was shot in England, of mm. course. Yeah. Um, and so it was one of the things that was that was on, that, you know, around then. And um, I'd had an amazing kind of couple of years. I'd, uh, the previous year, I'd done um, a film called Up and Under, uh, once again with Brian Glover, who was who was not very yeah. well yeah. Uh, by then. But um, uh, John Godber wrote and directed about uh, rugby league. And then I followed that with um, Amistad, the Spielberg film, which I just got a straight offer. That's one of the few straight offers I've got in my life was while I was in Cardiff filming up and under with the phone call. That would be Hollywood. Hey, Ralph, you've been offered <laughs> Amistad, Spielberg's film. And not all of the other people in up and under were like, who the fucking hell are you? You know what I mean? Could yeah. not believe it. I couldn't believe it. So it's like there's luck and then there's being touched with some lucky dust, you know what I mean? Mm. So I'd just done those two pictures and then the auditions for Star Wars came around and so my name was obviously on some lists of people who were working and uh, people who pe people who were in things that were going to come out. So therefore, you know what I mean? And that's how it works. It's like if you're in something that's about to come out, uh, they, they'll take a bit of a punt on you because it might be a hit and then they might have somebody who's in a hit. So it's, it's like a kind of momentum thing. And um, I, I went up for Star Wars, and they were most of the actors who were up for it were, were going to be playing creatures or, or, or CGI created, you know, things. Yeah, they were going to have their face in the film, and I, I, I was going up for a voice. I remember going and doing about twenty-five different voices because that was my calling card, really, because I could do lots of different accents, you know. And so I did lots of different accents, and it was really good fun. And then um, get back, and they they, they want you to play the pilot. And so that was that. I, I, was, I didn't do a voice. <laughs> I, d I actually did a sort of some, my American accent version of me, I think. And uh, I remember standing on set in, uh, in that spaceship with Natalie and Liam Neeson, Ewan McGregor, and uh, Liam and Ewan being really, really not enjoying doing the dialogue, really not enjoying that type of dialogue, you know, like yeah. the dilithium crystals, you know, uh, shields <laughs> down, you know, and so on and so forth. They were like, they, they felt slightly... Whereas for me, who was born and bred on Star Trek, I loved saying that kind of stuff. I was like, that's proper science fiction chat, you know? Yeah, you look like, you can tell you were loving it. Warp Factor 2, sir. It's all of that. And I just, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. So one question for you from it, though. Do you actually own your own action figure from The Phantom Menace? Um, you mean, do I get royalties on it? Or do you mean, <laughs> have I got one? Have you got one? And do you get royalties on it? <laughs> I have got one, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Weirdly enough, I think somebody gave me one at one of those conventions. Weirdly enough, it actually looks like me. It does. It's got my chin and everything and my nose and my ears. <laughs> yeah, it looks a bit, little bit like uh, LBJ, but it, it also looks a bit like me as well. Yeah. You mean Lucas didn't give you one? <laughs> I certainly know he certainly did not give me one. Uh, didn't give me anything, actually, Lucas. And... Um, we fell out as a result of that. Yeah, God, can't even give you your own toy. Go no, I'm not, well, I'm not going to give you a toy. I'm not going to give you a toy, Ralph. No, <laughs> no. You, you need to do that line faster and more intense. Faster and yeah. more intense. Uh, one more, faster and more intense. Uh, and, and it was like I said, um, nobody calls me Rick Ollier in this film, George. Nobody says my name. So if when I'm billed as Rick Ollier, Ralph Brown, nobody's going to know who that is. They're going to go, which one was that? 
I'm just saying, because obviously I've got a thing about billing now. Do you know what I mean? After Wentz World 2, put me on the poster. And now I'm going, Rick Ollier, nobody says, he goes, don't worry about that, Ralph. You're going to have a whole website dedicated to your character. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm just so not, you know. But the thing that I didn't didn't like about, like when it eventually came out, is, is me and um, Hugh Corshi didn't get invited to the premiere in London. No. You know, and there was all these people from Brookside and what have you there and we were like wait a minute where's our invite I'm like no no and it, I was like that is just astonishingly rude oh yeah and I mentioned it to uh, when I when I um, was in Sundance few, a few years later I mentioned it to or maybe it was the next year that year or whatever mentioned it to a journalist and she of course published it in the New York Times uh, George Lucas lacks common human decency I think was the quote <laughs> 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 so I wasn't in the next two. Fair enough. Uh, and I'm sure, of course, George George Lucas didn't have anything to do with who gets invited to the premiere. In a way, perhaps he should, though. You know, and it's like, well, that should be taken care of somehow. You know what I mean? It, it was pretty astonishing. And it was like you're working for a corporation. In fact, it was it was still something very corporate and wrong with it all. Yeah, well, I mean, considering you were a surviving character as well, you're right there at the end. Uh, I did find it bizarre that the characters of you and Hugh Quashi as well didn't transfer over into, say, Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith. I guess, kind of. Now we know. I don't know. I don't know why Hugh didn't, um, but I, I know why I didn't because yeah. I I was very rude about George, um, and I'm sure it wasn't anything to do there. And I'm sure he's a very kind man, but at the same time, he's the head name on a corporate project that is doesn't appear to be interested in its um, component parts and I don't take too kindly to that you know that's just no yeah. that's not the kind of business I went into it's kind of what it's become in many ways at a certain level certainly at that level well I suppose yeah, the shame. one good thing about it is your character does have his own web page on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, the Star Wars. Ralph Brown has his own page dedicated to Rick Oley. <laughs> yeah, that that should cheer me up, really, shouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, and you can add <laughs> what you want to it, so you can just yeah. put loads of stuff on there. It'd be great. So, okay, let's move on from Star Wars. One question, which has still confused many people to this day. What the hell happened with the Exorcist prequel? Yeah, it got made twice. Mm. They let Paul shoot the whole thing. Um, but they, they wouldn't let him finish it. They wouldn't give him the money to finish it. And they decided to bring in Rennie Harlan. And then he recast some of the parts, I think. Or just reshot some of the scenes. I, I, don't, I didn't really pay any much attention to his version of it because I wasn't in it. I, I was a Schrader loyalist on that project. So that was good fun, though, doing that. Even though that was a horror film and therefore we should have had a horrible experience. Perhaps it was just Paul who had the horrible experience. We were in Morocco. We were in Marrakesh. Stellan Skarsgård, who's alleged having a go at me at the end of the day's shooting in the bar. So what's up with you, Ralph? You give me all the fireworks on your shot, then you turn around on me, and then you're just doing nothing. What's wrong with you, man? Oh, that's good. I'm like, <laughs> that's very good. I'm like, that's your shot, though, Stellan. That's your shot. That's not my shot. I, I, he said, yes, but I need your energy in my shot. You got my energy in your shot, so I need yours in mine. It's a collaboration, man. You don't just turn it up and turn it down, depending on who shot it is. What's wrong with you, man? It's about the energy between us. I was like, you're absolutely right, Selene. I'm so sorry. I do apologize. I said, it must be something. It must be a bad habit I picked up in Hollywood where some actor must have said to me, hey, hey, Ralph, Ralph, it's not your shot. Because I was doing the energy in their shot. And they were like, mm-mm, you know. They didn't want that. They'd already worked out what they were doing. It didn't make any difference what I was going to do. They were going to do that. I'm just there to do the lines. And some actors prefer, you know, the other actor not even to be there. And sometimes they're not there for yours, you know, as well. So there's all kinds of nonsense going on. But I think that's what happened. And Stellan just quite correctly pulled, you know, pulled me up on it. And um, he was absolutely right. He's a, he's a legend as well. He was in Amistad, so we already knew each other. So we had a kind of shorthand, you know. I have a funny feeling as to what the answer to this one's going to be, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Which do you personally feel was the better out of the two, the Schrader or the Harlan cuts? I haven't seen the Harlan. So you stick with Schrader. I'm a Schrader loyalist. Yes. Well, dozens of TV and movie roles later, you finally get something in common with our Steve here when you appear as status quo's roadie Barney on Coronation Street. 
Uh, 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 I remember this well. Blew my mind when I saw it just in passing the screen as my parents were watching it. I was like, that's status quo? Is that Ralph Brown? So, I mean, how how did this kind of come about? Uh, Well, that was one of the few straight offers. Um, It was just one of those beautiful things where they were like, I mean, I was was in a little rock band at school when I was a teenager and we did three status quo songs. To, To work with status quo was just was just outstanding um and on that show as well and i just thought i have to do danny again i have to do he has to be wheeled out for the possibly the last time but you know i've kept my powder dry with that character i haven't done it very often but that was uh, an honor to do that show um and so worthy of danny of, of that and yeah they just they just said do you want to do it and they sent me and i was like yeah so <clears throat> turned up the first scene was um uh, and I think I might have worn some of my own clothes and they were happy with that and I think I had long hair from I had extensions in my hair from doing Nighty Night with uh, with Julia Davis um, down in um, Somerset somewhere in no, Cornwall and um, yeah so I drove up to Manchester and kept the extensions in so everything worked you know for, for Danny to, to be revived and um, first thing I had to do was get a round of drinks in the Rovers' return for the quo. And Bill Tarmy is sitting there, uh, as he always is. He's kind of carved out of nicotine and uh, red leather <laughs> at the edge of the bar there. You know, because he was, Bill Tarmy uh, was, an, was, a, was an extra for 15 years before he even said a word, you know. And then he became a character and then he became... A, a, a legend, yeah. extraordinary man, um, Jack Dawkins. Yeah. So I'm doing this thing, and he he has to say to me, "Excuse me, line, are those fellas over there look very familiar," <laughs> and I have to go, "A status quo, man." And he's like, "You are." I have to go, you know, rock, rocking all over the world, and that was that was the kind of dialogue. Take the drinks back to the boys, and and, and then they would. Uh, they would they would go cut, and and Ricky Parfit would like like uh, Benson Hedges, and so would I. And uh, you know, Bill, Bill's got a, still sitting at the bar, and he's got a, a fag permanently inside his hand, you know, like a roll up. And um, AD comes, guys, guys, sorry, sorry, guys, you can't smoke, um, you can't smoke on the set here. I said, well, Bill's smoking. He's like, yeah, that's Bill. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Ricky went outside for a fag. And then come back and keep going and move around. Camera goes to a different angle. Same thing. Still doing the same scene. Ooh, ooh, those lads look familiar. Ooh, those lads. And he goes to me, Ralph. Ralph? Your name's Ralph, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. He goes, you're doing very well, Ralph. I've had top <laughs> actors. I've had top A-list actors stand at this bar. And you know what? Their knees have gone. <laughs> uh, what a ledge. What a ledge. <laughs> So I stood at the bar of the Rovers' return with uh, Bill Tarmy, a.k.a. Jack Dodsworth, and my knees did not go. And that's probably the pinnacle of my entire acting career. I had something similar with it, because I did, I did Coronation Street twice as a delivery guy, both times. And mm. uh, the second time I was working with Beverly Callard, who plays... She mm, plays Liz McDonald, and uh, we were coming from makeup to the set, and this is at the new building that's in... Um, in the keys as opposed to the older one that was down in the centre of Manchester. And we're walking over to the set and she's going, are you nervous? I was like, no, I'm, I'm all right, actually. Oh, because we've had loads of people come through here. We had Ian McKellen on. He was really nervous. So she said yeah. that. I thought, well, I wasn't nervous, but I am now. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, they all live on Ian McKellen down there. It's like, and he was apparently nervous, I think. Yeah. That's why, that's why. And I think, you know, the, Maybe maybe Ian's knees went. Maybe. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, who else was on it? Was it Ben Kingsley? Was he one of the others? And then, I think so. Yeah. 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 I think Ben Kingsley was in there. It's, it's amazing how many like English stars have suddenly just started cropping up in uh, Coronation Street over the years. It is kind of the the starting ground for many actors as well, especially if you're from Manchester. It's mm-hmm. like the English institution. Uh, and speaking of actually English institutions, a nice segue here. In the 2000s, it was always classed as you're truly an English actor if you appeared in one of two things. Uh, one being the Harry Potter movies uh, and the other being a Richard Curtis movie. 
Now, firstly, I want to ask, were you even ever contacted about a role in a Harry Potter movie? And secondly, was the music a major appeal to appear in a movie like The Boat That Rocked? Uh, I was eventually contacted to appear in a Harry Potter film, but only after I'd done The Boat That Rocked. Fiona Weir being the casting director for both of those things. And, um, and I said to Fiona when I was doing The Boat That Rocked, why haven't you cast me in Harry Potter yet? And she said, oh, yeah, that's a good point. And she uh, got me a role as one of the parents in the final episode when it all becomes this kind of dark civil war. But uh, my storyline, that particular storyline got cut, so I never ended oh, up doing it. That'll be Bill. That'll be Bill. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Bill's going to message me now after he hears this episode and say, what a bunch of bullshit. I didn't cut him out. <laughs> Somebody did. And it wasn't me anyway. It was a bunch of us, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, I always I always wished I'd been in, in Harry Potter because it was, as you say, it was a mark of um, not status or credentials, but it was acceptability, I suppose, in the acting yeah. world. It was sort of vis- visibility as well. But, I, you know, I'd already done a, f- a few of those. My wife is now doing the stage version. Uh, on Broadway, so maybe that was her gig to do, not mine. Um, and uh, Richard Curtis, I really wanted to do that film because it was about Radio Caroline, which I grew up with listening to Radio Caroline. You know, Radio 1 didn't start until 1967. You know, I'd have been 10 years old by then, so we used to listen to the Pirates and most of the pop music there. And, um, yeah, to play, a, to play a DJ on a pirate radio station was, was a dream come true, truly. And, of course, you got to work with... One of my favourite actors, uh, the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, as well, who is I did. A very fantastic sweet man. in that movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, this is slightly nerdy, but but uh, they asked all the guys who are uh, the people who are playing DJs to make a radio show, make one hour radio show, and they filmed it. They filmed us just for a whole hour, you know, and we had to choose which records we were going to play and what we were going to say in between the records. And my character was a kind of John Peel. Um, Bob, what's his name from the old Great Whistle Test, who, who wasn't a pirate, but but he was a kind of mixture of those people. And, and John Peel used to read poems, you know, on his show, bits of Alice in Wonderland and Winnie the Pooh and stuff like that. He was very kind of imaginative and eccentric. So I, I, I really loved putting that together. And they filmed it, and then it just disappeared. It didn't end up on a DVD outtake or anything like that. It's just gone, you know. But I put quite a lot of energy into, <laughs> into that. Uh, yeah, dear, dear Phil, um, he died the night before or the day we landed in New York when we moved here, 2014. Wow. God, it's, it's weird to think it was 2013. It still feels incredibly recent. Yeah. yeah. He was a really, really talented actor. Really was. Yes. So fun to watch. Um, right, dozens of roles followed this, but then we see Ralph Brown join Marvel as the villain Dr. Faustus in Agent Carter. Now, it's an amazing turn throughout the first series, and there was a sign-off working with Toby Jones at the very end. How secretive was it at the time working for Marvel and not revealing what was happening with this character? Yeah, c- kind of completely. Um, they don't give you paper. They send you links to things, then they kind of disappear, you know? It's very secretive indeed, and it was nice to nice to work with Toby. We had a good old um, natter that day. I, I suppose we both thought that story was going to continue, but it doesn't seem to, so I don't know. I enjoyed that character very much. I also love Hayley Atwell. She's just a, a really sweet, sweet person. So could we potentially see Dr. Faust's return? I think, obviously, you never say never with Marvel. I don't know. I, re- I, 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 if, I if I was told not to tell you, I would say I've been told not to tell you. But uh, I wasn't told not to tell you. I don't know. And I suspect that's because they don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what I mean? And I was told when I did it, uh, when you do a Marvel gig, you, you that's it. You, you have to, that's your character. So if your character dies, that's it. You're not going to be doing another Marvel show. You only get to do that one character. Of course, we can all think of examples of actors who've done more than one character in yes. like, two different Marvel shows. So that wasn't actually true, but. These are the things that actors talk about uh, in between setups. <laughs> <laughs> the week that I met you in LA when we finally got together in person, you were actually shooting Agent Carter right around that time. Yeah. Uh, so I remember everything was extremely like hush hush. As far as we fast forward to today, 
you're still very much working. You've recently played President Lyndon Johnson in The Godfather of Harlem, which is a great series. I know mm-hmm. you probably haven't seen it, Steve, but you really should. It really is that good. You also played Steed in Dave Batista's recent action movie, Final Score, mm-hmm. which I actually really enjoyed. It's a good throwback mm. to your Die Hard style movies. And uh, it was just, it, it basically is uh, Van Damme's movie, Sudden Death, but with a football game instead of uh, an actual ice hockey game. Uh, you also voice in video games as well, which is right up Steve's alley, especially oh, yes. in R- Red Dead Redemption 2. I've played that. I've, I've done, mm. I've played that. <laughs> I bet you don't know which one I was. I've not got a clue, no. I did no. have a look on IMDb and, and uh, it said it was various, like various townsfolk. Nope, it no. certainly wasn't various townsfolk. Oh, IMDb lies. Oh, I okay. I have to know so that's now. That's because they don't know. <laughs> ah, can we get a review? Uh, Is it? I haven't something? played the game, so it's hard for me to uh, to to kind of nail it down. But I, I did a Scottish accent for four hours, you know. So if you ever get to that little forgotten corner of the game where there's suddenly a Scottish character appears, that'll be me. Oh right. Well, the, the, the main campaign's like about 60 hours long, so there's a hell of a lot going on in there. <laughs> mad, isn't it? It's just yeah. mad. It's crazy. Back in our day of games, it was like five levels. That'll do. Mm. <laughs> Finish it in half an hour. But obviously now, how do you kind of choose your roles later in life? Uh, we, we did kind of discuss on this, but do you look for fleshed out and deep characters? Uh, do you see the overall story and work out what you can bring to them? A mixture of both? You know, what's your jam? Um, do I want to be in it? <laughs> do you want to be jam. in it? Yeah. Do I want to be in this? You know? Do I want to be this guy in this? And I've now got a standard I have to keep up. You know? I can't be third copper on the left in that. Because people are going, oh, they used to be good, didn't they? I can't have yeah. that. And it wouldn't make me happy anyway. It, it would actually make me think about myself in a sad way and I do that enough of that myself anyway without having it proved by my work so I have to be quite careful about what I do and so as a result I don't do as much as I used to because I'm just picky and, and I don't get offered that much either if I'm really honest if I was offered more stuff you might see more stuff so if someone kind of turned around and said we've got an idea where uh, an older Danny and an older Del Preston actually meet, and it turns out that they really are long lost brothers and go on a road trip across America. <laughs> what do you think of like, playing two characters in one? <laughs> I suppose I, it would depend if I found it funny. I, it, it would probably be somebody who said, And would you like to write it as well? Yeah. You know, I'd be like, No, you're all right. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I don't, I'm not that interested in doing a stage version of it, which is being talked about at the moment and all that. I, I, kind of, I can't really improve on what I've done with that yeah. character by repeating it. It feels like when you start to milk it in that way, yes. it loses the flavour. Mm. You've got to be careful with your legacy. And I think as you get older as an actor, you, you're, you're thinking about, and as a musician, I think you're, you're thinking about your legacy, really. And you need to protect it. You need to look after it. Well, as we mentioned at the top of the uh, top of the show, you've worked with some of the best directors in the business. Um, which directors really worked well with your method of preparation and work rate, and which ones really taught you something new about the business? I think they well they 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 all taught me something new. Um, a director I absolutely adored was um, Stuart Orm, who directed Ivanhoe for the BBC. In fact, I ended up doing five or six jobs with Stuart over the years always TV work and he had this fantastic habit of saying okay we're gonna do if the shot was um, a kind of more or less static shot he wouldn't necessarily instead of saying cut at the end he would go go again and he and he would just leave it roll and so you could do two takes one after the other brilliant brilliant idea because you're still warm Um, and the other thing he does is he goes cut okay well I think we've got one that the BBC would be happy with Let's do one for us. And he, and he means it. He doesn't say that unless he's got the tape that he can use in the show. And then he goes, just to see what happens, let's just do one more. See what happens. Which is uh, not enough directors do. <laughs> I think it's a really good idea, you know. Because um, you never know what's going to come 
when somebody's relaxed and they've got the pressure off. I really liked working with David Fincher, although he liked to do a lot of takes. Even though he didn't know when he was doing Alien 3 that he could do ADR, automated dialogue replacement, which meant that if he didn't like the line reading, he could get it in ADR. He didn't have to keep shooting the same scene just because somebody wasn't saying the line the way he wanted it, which is what happened with Sigourney and I, because she, she didn't like me at the time and she kept saying, oh, that's a, that's a good idea. And she couldn't get the sarcasm out of her voice. And he was like, why are you saying, just say it like it's a good idea, you know, <laughs> and she wouldn't. And so he just made her do it 39 times. And um, eventually he got it. And then two years later, when we were doing the ADR, and, and, and I did two days of ADR because there was so much steam in it and, and uh, so much noise that, that, that you had to make to make the steam. So the visuals always dominate when you're filming and the sound is always secondary. And um, he was like, I didn't realise I could, I could do all this all over again. So I wouldn't have done 39 takes if I'd known that. But of course, I've heard that, that he still does do 39 takes uh, if he wants to and that he actually quite enjoys that. I don't know what, what you would call that, but he still enjoys that. And it's a kind of a discipline if you're the actor, trying to make it fresh every time if you're doing it that often. Absolute nightmare in, uh, for certain people, I would think. But uh, his attention to detail is second to none, uh, I have to say. Kind of like a Kubrick in a way. Mm. Lots of takes and very attentive. Spielberg was inspiring because he was literally making it up as he went along. And he would come along and, and he'd say, OK, just and do that bit then, do that bit there. And, we, you know, we'd do a master shot and he'd come, he'd say, everyone freeze and we'd all have to stand still. And then he'd come and he'd walk around and he'd look around and go, hey, how you doing, everybody? How's, 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 how's it going? Think, oh, do, you two, do that bit there. Do that bit there and we'd do it. And he'd go, wait a minute. And he'd just kind of move around to the back or behind you. He'd go, yeah, do it again, do it again. OK, just move forward a bit. I'm shopping for shots. And then he goes, okay, camera's here. Don't move. Because that camera's here. And everyone's like, <laughs> the whole room explodes. Because that means clear the back of that shot. Get the camera, put it there. Make sure that these people are in makeup and, and look, you know, and it was like that. So they were, he would lead that. He didn't have a shot list. It's absolutely fantastic to watch him making that film. And he was deliberately doing that to himself. He was, he was doing, working fast because he wanted the discipline of it, I suppose. Yeah, it's a great film as well. Lovely man. Yeah, they're all inspiring in different ways. Ang, Ang, Lee's, uh, Ang Lee absolutely loves actors and uh, is, is a really good director of actors, you know, and he won't let you get away with doing a dishonest line. He will keep you going until he believes what you're saying. A uh, very gifted director. Well, it's definitely four incredible names of directors there that... Uh pretty much leads us in to the point where we have to really ask Ralph to nominate five. Aye, aye. Now's the time to nominate five. Nominate five? Yes, nominate five. Not three, or four, or six, or nine. Now's the time to nominate five. It's all right. I'll, I'll make myself look sexy in the edit. Yeah, that was just seamless, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what is Nominate 5, Steve? Well, Nominate 5 is the part of the show where we invite our guest, if we have one, like we do today, to nominate five of a certain thing. It's entirely dependent on what guests we have on. Sometimes we have people who we want to choose their best musical cues throughout a film or the best movies that they've been in or the best pieces of cinematography that they've seen and today because we've got ralph brown in we are going to do your nominate five which is going to be andy to nominate five of the best uses of a song in a movie mm. yeah so, my favorite ones i wouldn't say the best ones. that's not the best that's, that's never the best you know what i mean you get into that argument and it's like well everyone's got their own version of that Okay, what is at number five? Well, can I? Would you mind if I gave a special mention to something that I've been in, which I didn't choose, which is Wayne's World Two, "Spirit in the Sky" by Norman Greenbaum, mm -hmm. which is a yes. piece of music that I didn't know was going to be in the film till I saw it at the premiere, and there was me training the roadies at roadie camp for Wayne Stark, um, and this this song just suddenly blasts out of the speakers, and I was like. Wow, I was absolutely thrilled to bits, and I still am, but it's not in my top five. 
Number five is Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head by B.J. Thomas, written by Bacharach and David in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance mm. Kid. I was just thinking about this today. It's just a perfect moment. It's a sort of a light film. It's a tense film, but suddenly it goes somewhere else, and it's so right, and it's so beautiful, and it's such a beautiful song. And it doesn't appear to be in the right film, but it's absolutely in the right film. Yeah, it fits perfectly. I think it fits perfectly to the point that it has been pastiched a number of times. (laughs) And I think you kind of know that something's working well when it's reached that kind of level of popular consciousness. Yeah, very true. Yeah. So, okay, what is your number four? Uh, My number four is Taxi Driver. Uh, The theme to Taxi Driver, the last thing that Bernard Herrmann wrote, Bernard Herrmann's great soundtrack writer for Hitchcock and many, many others. And he wrote this uh, incredible kind of jazz score for for, um, Taxi Driver, written by Paul Schrader, directed by Martin Scorsese. Tom Scott playing the tenor saxophone. Mm. Um, You're just, you're in New York after midnight in a taxi, when you, as soon as you start hearing that piece of music, it's just so slinky, sexy, dirty, and just slightly scary. It's brilliant. And Steve was actually introduced to this movie for the first time yeah. about, probably about a month ago. No, it was longer than that. It's about was eight, it longer than that? eight, about eight weeks ago now. It was came up in uh, what's in the box, but I had heard the the theme from Taxi Driver before because there was uh, a free CD that was on the front cover of Total Film once, and <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, and uh, it had themes from like um, Fight Club and The General's Daughter and uh, Straight Story, and it also had the theme from Taxi Driver. So I know I, I knew about the music before I knew about the film. And you're absolutely right. It's a haunting, seductive, slightly laconic theme, but with this undercurrent of tension, and it, it just puts you in mind of New York. Really, you're always kind it's of delicious, isn't it? It's yeah. a delicious piece of music. Yes. Um, I, I I purposely play that song when I'm driving through Salford. So. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it, it works as well, doesn't it? I bet it does. <laughs> it does. But the first time we've had a guest who knows exactly what Salford's like as well. <laughs> <laughs> they lost a member of Quo there. Okay, what's your number three, Ralph? My number three is Man with a Harmonica from Once Upon a Time in the West, directed nice. by Sergio Leone, mm. written by Ennio Morricone and played on the harmonica by the Belgian specialist Toots Tielemans. It comes all the way through the film, this funny this noise of somebody playing a harmonica. And there's only like two notes in it, three notes in it. And when you find out why there are only three notes in that harmonica tune, it's just the most devastating bit of cinema you've ever seen in your life. If you, I'm not going to spoil it for everybody. If you mm. haven't seen Once Upon a Time in the West, Steve, just <clears throat> see it. Just see it. It's just... Uh, a masterpiece both on every single level directing writing uh, score cinematography love it and the music is just sensational i get the hairs on the back of my neck every time i hear it number two number two yes what do we have for number two uh, is from oh lucky man lindsay anderson one of my top films the only film that does this with its soundtrack is when they want to have a song in the film they cut to a studio where Alan Price and his band play the song. Hmm. And they just film them singing that song. And it kind of bleeds over into the first shot of the next sequence. And then they turn up in the film later. Uh, He's hitchhiking and this van pulls over and it's Alan Price and the band. And he gets in with them and he hangs out with them for a a few scenes. Very organic. Um, There's a song called Poor People, uh, which is, I think, the second or third song in the film. Poor people are poor people and they don't understand. A man's got to make whatever he wants and take it with his own hands. It's a, it's a really um, it's a really sweet song and it's a really hard song to listen to. It's brilliant. Yeah, maybe the first time that movie's been uh, announced on here. It's a brilliant film. Really the same combo of people who made uh, If. Brilliant. Lindsay Anderson and Malcolm McDowell. And my favourite piece of music from a movie is... America from West Side Story. Oh. This oh. is Rita Moreno and George Chakiris 
uh, both of whom won Oscars, I think, with Yvonne Wilder, Suzanne Kay, and Joan Meyer singing Leonard Bernstein's music and Stephen Sondheim's lyrics. It's supposed to be Puerto Rican music. It, it isn't really. It's kind of Spanish, Mexican. Mm. Um, it's a variety of different uh, influences there. But bloody hell fire. It's just one of the, me- the most exciting moments in film history. It's very true. Uh, I... It's funny. It's clever. It's witty. It's sexy. It's just pow. It's pow. It hits you right out the gate as well. And the just the sheer vibrancy of it, it doesn't let up really until the end, does it? Yeah. And because I'm in New York now, I've suddenly realised that I've got a big hole in my in my musical uh, kind of encyclopedia, which is which is um, salsa, and salsa comes from Puerto Rico, and, and it comes from New York. In fact, uh, it comes from Puerto Ricans who live in New York. Those people who were singing that song, America, would have been dancing to salsa at night, and um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's just digging digging that history and having having a listen to all of that sort of stuff, and so that's why that's why it's my number one right now. There you go, Steve. It takes you right back to Carlito's way from the other month. Yeah, as well as uh, connection with Richard Mirisch. Exactly. Yeah, and the Mirisch Mirish Company Mirish. from back in the day. Well, that is uh, a fantastic f- nominate five plus honourable mention. <laughs> we didn't get the countdown right again this week. Uh, we, we're getting it right. We're getting it. We get the uh, extra mentions. At, at in least there. it was in order. We had the extra mention, yeah, but the rest of it was in order. So we have to thank you for that, Ralph, because most guests just throw them at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> but and speaking of music, you also have a little website project that I definitely want to speak about here. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about it because it is your pop life. It is. I, um, I had this idea of... of um, writing about my favourite music and why it was my favourite music in little chapters as a blog. And actually, as it's turned out, it turns out that I'm actually writing my life story through the prism of music, through through the prism of song. Um, and I think if I'd sat down to write my autobiography, I would have been a much more constipated about it, really, and maybe not even done anything. But because I was writing about my favourite song, somehow it became easier to write, perhaps. And I'm still going. I mean, I've done 260 now and still going. Uh, each chapter is a, is a different song. It's a different film I did or a different person in my life or a different moment in my life. And um, it's at uh, magicmenagerie.wordpress.com. And I will say people will go check it out. I have been dipping into it all week. Uh, as soon as you told me about it, you sent me a link. I've been looking at it and it is so easy to read and it's so fascinating and it's really an inspiring sight to actually read. It makes you think about all your own soundtrack of your life, basically. So do go and check it out at uh, magicmenagerie.wordpress.com, was that? That's right. I mean, everyone's got their own pop, pop life. One day it will be a podcast and then one day... I'll be running the podcast and I'll be having guests on telling me their pop life. And I'll say, you've got an hour and I want four of your tunes. And I want to know why they're your tunes. You know what I mean? And that'll be, that'll be what I'm going to be doing with it. So you heard it here first and don't nick that idea. <laughs> no fear. Well, we don't idea. want to get set on by a Bengal tiger. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've got one backstage. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He keeps it in a box. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Can't be expected to work under these conditions. I really can't. No, you can't. Okay, quickly. What's what's in the box? Well, what's in the box is a part of the show where Andy tries to teach me more about movies than just simple big budget action films and adaptations of video games. He's going to put his hand into a box and pull out the name of a movie which is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. If I haven't seen it, then I go away and watch it the night before we record the next episode. If I have seen it, then we keep picking out names until we find one that I haven't seen. Simple. Easy. And it rarely goes past two. So I've picked one out here. We got and three ones, but that was a one-off. That was a one-off. Okay, we have a 2007 movie called Rogue that was directed by Greg McLean, who directed Wolf Creek. And it's great because it's a Manny in Crocodile movie. It's right up your alley. Rogue. No, I haven't seen it. Good. I knew you hadn't because you've never seen anything. So we want to say a huge thank you 
to our very good friend Ralph Brown for coming and joining us today, mm -hmm. uh, sharing a lot of history, educating us all. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on, Ralph. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm really chuffed that you invited me, and I'm sorry I didn't tell more jokes. That's okay. We'll, we'll get the chance to when we bring you back again. <laughs> <laughs> we have plans for you. Yes. <laughs> I look forward to it. In the meantime, I guess it's a, a goodbye from me. And it's an Auf Wiedersehen from me. Uh, and it's a cheerio, everybody, from me. <laughs>